Optophobia, the fear of opening one's eyes. This podcast is dedicated to encouraging you, our listeners, to move beyond that fear, to solve riddles they don't want us to unriddle, to investigate supposedly ironclad truths, to unearth evidence buried for so long they believed it would stay buried. Season 4. It's likely you've never heard of the most important movie of 1989. That's because in the end, Relentless was just another forgotten 1980s slasher film. But director William Lustig's original plan could have changed cinematic history forever. Lustig flavored his movie with enough subliminal messaging to spark mass murder by hundreds of wannabe serial killers sitting in the nation's theaters that summer. Why didn't it work? And why is Lustig still taking lunch meetings in Hollywood rather than rotting in jail? This season on Optophobia, we'll track down the distortions, the assumptions, the omissions. Are you bored by the lies? Open your eyes. Hi, everybody. I am your host, Jeremy Jam. There has been something of a gold rush in song catalogs lately. Artists are selling their rights to large corporations. Older acts like Blondie, Rick James, and Chrissy Hind have all cashed in lately. Late last year, Stevie Nicks sold most of her songwriting catalog for $80 million. But you also have younger artists selling their song catalogs like Imagine Dragons and The Killers. Just a week after the Stevie Nicks deal, actually, Bob Dylan sold his entire songwriting catalog, six decades worth, more than 600 songs, to Universal for a reported 300 to $400 million. These are songs that tapped into and contributed to the zeitgeist of the 1960s, blown in the wind, the times they are a change in, like a rolling stone. Lyrics from these songs that Dylan has now sold and others earned a Nobel Prize for Dylan in 2016. Powerful writing like come mothers and fathers throughout the land and don't criticize what you can't understand or democracy don't rule the world. You'd better get that in your head. This world is ruled by violence, but I guess that's better left unsaid or she knows there's no success like failure and that failure is no success at all. This trend in giant music publishers paying millions for culturally influential songwriting that will remain important for decades, if not centuries into the future, has critics wondering which other artists will soon benefit from enormous paydays for their poetic words of wisdom. And there's one artist who's at the top of nearly every one of those critics lists Cisco. His 1999 mega hit Thong Song includes some of the most important lyrics from the turn of the millennium. She had dumps like a truck, 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 thighs like a what, 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 baby, move your butt, butt, butt. But our guest today says there was more to the Thong Song than its moving lyrics. And what she has to say is deeply disturbing. But before we find out the connection between Cisco and William Lustig, I want to welcome my co-host for this week, Jeffrey Dahlmer. Thank you so much for hitting the L. It's been, it's been a week. Thank you, Jeremy. What's going on? What happened this week? Oh, so at work, um, what's it called? The uh, what, what's that term the kids are using? Uh, the, uh, TikTok? No, a lady who's uh, obnoxious in public, like screaming at people, not following rules. Oh, Karen. Karen, the suburban. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, yeah. We had a woman named Catherine come in. Okay. Into Hollywood video. Into Hollywood video. And, uh, you know, since the pandemic's happened, a lot of people are like fighting to not have to wear a mask. But she came in. And she was wearing a mask. She was just upset that we did not have the mask. Oh, oh you didn't have the Jim Carrey movie, The Mask. Yeah, we, we don't carry Jim Carrey movies ever since he officially became 
an artist, uh, like a painter. Oh, we only carry movies of active actors. So Jim Carrey, I, I didn't realize that he had become a painter. No one did. So he's retired. He's a painter now, and we stopped using his catalog. So Liar Liar is gone. The Mask is gone. Huh. Those are the only two movies we carried, I think. And Ace Ventura, I think, is the only other one. So there's a policy at Hollywood Video that when an actor retires from acting, even if they're doing something else, you guys get rid of the stock of their movies from the Hollywood video. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be like an official announcement. We, we make that call whether or not an actor is retired. So even though Jim Carrey has never said he is a painter. Yeah. But he keeps going on shows talking about his painting. His, he, and so we figured, Oh, he must not be acting anymore. He must be painting. Right. Are there other actors that you've taken off the shelves? Um, we took off Robert De Niro. All of his movies are gone. He's not acting anymore. What's he doing? I think he's doing politics. He's trying to get into politics? I think he made a comment about politics on his Twitter, and so we took all of his movies down. Um, Jamie Lee Curtis, we took down all her movies. Sigourney Weaver. What, what are they doing now? We couldn't figure that out. You just hadn't seen them in movies. Yeah, hadn't seen them in movies. So, so that's the thing at Hollywood Video. If you have not been in a movie in the past year, you're probably not an actor. Yeah, you're not an actor if you haven't been in a movie in the past year. Right. I mean, technically speaking, that's accurate. If you haven't done a movie in a whole year, are you an actor? Are a lot of these movies that are being made now even do they even have DVDs? <sighs> yeah, that's another thing. Or video. Yeah, well, we have the it's DVD, but we're also trying to do I don't know why they're doing this. We're trying to do an online catalog so they can digitally rent the movies. But even that is like we're still removing the digital movie if they haven't done a movie in a, over a year. Yeah. And then you have people who come back like Jason Momoa. So we saw Jason Momoa who was in uh, Game of Thrones and he was acting there. And then um, we saw he was uh, not in any movies. And we saw that he was coming out in Aquaman and we thought, oh, he's acting again. And then we watched Aquaman and we realized there's no acting in the movie. So we took him off the shelf again. So you never stocked Aquaman because it, there was no acting in it? No. And, and coincidentally enough, uh, no one came in asking for Aquaman either. So we, I feel like that was, a, that was one of those right calls that we spotted early. But anyway, she came in and she was yelling about us not having the mask. And we were like, sorry, uh, Catherine, we don't have the mask because he has not done a movie in the past year. So she threw over a lot of the shelves. She took her hand and ran down the shelves and knocked off a lot of the uh, DVD cases and the little certificates that you bring up to the front. So that's how my uh, my week's been going. Some drama from the Catherine Karen. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, uh, I'm sorry to hear about your week. I hope this this next one is is better. But I want to get to our guest for this week. Unfortunately, our scheduled guest this week, Bernadette Seymour, a former production assistant for William Lustig, was unable to make the show. Bernadette told our producers that after we promoted her appearance on last week's show, Lustig called her at the Rusty Anchor Marina in Delray Beach, Florida, where she's the head of the yard crew and threatened to, quote, put a hole in your hull if she came on our show. Hmm. So a couple things about that. One, it's obviously abhorrent, possibly criminal behavior to threaten violence against a former employee who has every right to tell her story on optophobia. Mm -hmm. Secondly, wow, William Lustig is listening to our show, which is amazing. How cool is that? It's a big deal. Yeah. So, Mr. Lustig, if you're listening right now, please respond to our calls or emails that we've been sending you, uh, inviting you to be a guest. We'd love to have you on and ask why you tried to kill hundreds of innocent people. We were, however, lucky enough to set up an interview at the very last minute with a great guest joining us from her home in L.A., Marissa Horn is with us. Welcome to Optophobia, Marissa. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you for having me. Wow, you live in LA too? I, I do. I do. Sunny LA. Oh, cool. It's a wonderful place. Are you East LA or West LA? Or? East West. You Oh, so you have a, one of those uh, apartments that's on the border. I like the best of both worlds. Marissa, have you ever been into or seen the Hollywood video? 
where Jeffrey works? I've driven past it. I, I try to limit my interaction with technology. This is a lot um, being on the show today, actually. Yes, yeah, so I'm sure your your establishment, your your video establishment, is a lovely one, but uh, it's not. Maybe if you thought about a different decor, have you tried to sage the Hollywood video? Actually, they do sage the Hollywood video uh, once a month to get rid of the bad spirits, um, but we can't change the decor because that's that's controlled by corporate. That's why it's better to be a small business owner. Jeffrey, is corporate actually in your store? Because your store is the only Hollywood video left. Yeah, so technically a guy sits in the back and he is the rep from corporate. So. The headquarters is also the store. So your coworker is the only executive. Left. He's the CEO, COO, CFO. He's running a lot of hats. So you could just go ask him. I actually can't. There's a ch- there's a chain of command. How does that work? So I gotta send in a form to the COO about what's going on, and then they have a board meeting with the CFO and the CEO, and they discuss what comes in, and then they essentially. Uh, make the rules and coordinate a response back through. He's also the HR rep, so that's also confusing because uh, I often complain to him about him. So he just thinks about it with all those different hats on and then... Yeah, yeah. You think one man should have all that power? Oh, oh, no. I've been saying it for years that they should fold the company because he's... I mean, look how the company's being run. Like, we were the last Hollywood video, so it's obviously been failing, so just let it go. I'm fearful for you, though. What if that goes? What happens to you? You must find your path. I'm going to be honest and say I've never actually thought of what I'd do if this Hollywood video is closed. I do like hitchhiking. Mm. I've met some of the most interesting people on my hitchhiking adventures previously. Some friendships were shorter than others. If you catch my drift. Marissa, what do you what do you do in LA? I own a tea shop. I like tea. Do you have any infused teas? Oh, we have them all. We have infused, we have defused, we have green, we have orange. What's the name of your shop? I'd love to come by. Tea shop. Oh, it's called tea shop. Okay. Unfortunately, my my family actually grows tobacco. Come from Tobaccoville. You're far from home. Yes, intentionally so. Which I grew up with these dirty, horrible, bad for you leaves, and that's all I knew. And then one day I just realized I could inherit this life of something that kills you, or I could make a life where something that nourishes you. Mm. So that's why I I packed my bags one day. I didn't even say bye to Papa. And made a life for myself here. So it was just you and Papa on the tobacco fields? Yes. Yes. Let's take a quick break and we'll be right back with our guest, Marissa Horn. Hey, Optophobes. In the early 1970s, Hershey's needed a new tagline for Reese's peanut butter cups. The chocolate company turned to its ad agency, Ogilvy & Mather, which came up with the now-classic ad campaign featuring one person walking down the street eating chocolate and another walking toward them eating peanut butter out of a jar for some reason. The two bump into each other and food flies everywhere. For a second, everyone is enraged at the culinary mess. But then, tempers cool and they both discover, yes, two great tastes that taste great together. An Advertising Hall of Fame tagline for Ogilvy & Mather was born. We thought a lot about that ad campaign when we were creating our Meat Pops line of deli-flavored sodas. We've combined a lot of liquefied deli meat with flavored sodas recently, all to provide you with a lunch option where actual eating is unnecessary. But almost everyone's unexpected favorite is the combination of butterscotch and liverwurst. That's right. If you haven't tried our new Liverwurst Butterscotch Spray, you're in for a treat. We've added trace amounts of venom from the fur de lance, the most dangerous snake in Costa Rica, whose bite can cause oozing, swelling, bruising, blisters, numbness, fever, bleeding of the gums, impaired consciousness, and a tenderness of the spleen. But don't worry about any of that. Once you've had a sip of Liverwurst Butterscotch Spray, you won't believe the taste combo that you've been missing all these years. 
Blend Venom Solutions, two great tastes that snake great together. We are back with our guest this week, Marissa Horn. Marissa, before we uh, took a break, you were talking about your that you left North Carolina for L.A. Traditionally, people who leave their hometown for L.A. do so to try to find work in the entertainment industry. But it sounds like you kind of stuck a little bit close to home in, in one way and that you're making a living out of leaves. So I wonder how you've found LA as a North Carolinian and also how you've, what you've discovered about the entertainment industry since you've been in Los Angeles. Mm, yes, yes, yes. So I, I moved to really LA because I, I felt a calling. It was really entertainment. It was something that I didn't even think of. I, I felt actually silly looking back and not realizing I would be surrounded by entertainment. Um, when I opened my tea shop, I had a lot of famous people come in. Right? Oh, wow. Julia Roberts. I had Kevin Bacon. A lot of people. You know, like people who aren't acting anymore. Yeah. And then I had what I consider the love of my life come in to the store. Another celebrity? Yes. Um, Mark Andrews, to many people uh, who know him in society as Cisco. Oh, his real name is Mark Andrews? Yes, I would call him Marky Mark sometimes. Wow, that's kind of an insult. He liked it. It was a sweet pet name. The real Marky Mark doesn't even like being called Marky Mark. Wow. Mark Andrews. I would have never guessed that for Cisco. Cisco stopped in a Hollywood video before. You, you two have been graced with Cisco. He was in the full silver-haired get-up. Um, but he was holding what I thought was a coffee at the time. But now that I'm thinking back, it did have a little string and a little square thing dangling. So he had a tea with him. He probably was drinking silver needle tea with his silver hair. Probably. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Wow. I, I taught him quite a bit about tea. What are the things that teach him about tea? I taught him the exact temperature. You don't need to put boiling water in it. Oh. When you get a cup, you must put it our face over the cup so we let the essence feel over your face the calming mist of it wow he really enjoyed mist and he did look like he was sweating that was not sweat bro. That was, okay that was tea that was tea juice so marissa when you met cisco did you know who he was were you a fan of his music when i met him i had no idea i don't really keep up with celebrities i did not know he was even a celebrity. And the time when I met him, actually, he, he was in a slump. He he wasn't the Cisco people know. It was um, right when he stopped with his group, Drew Hill. That's who, I thought that was his real name. I thought Cisco's name was Drew Hill. That's the confusion I'm having. So that was the name of the group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad I'm, I'm educating you further. Okay. So he was in Drew Hill before... He had a solo career. Is that right? Yes. He came in and we met and I could tell he was searching and trying to find his path, like the path that you, Jeffrey, are trying to find too. Yeah. For me, when I see someone like that, I, I just, I'm drawn to people that are slightly lost. Oh, I'm very lost. I don't think there's anything slight about it. To be honest, I'm, I'm quite drawn to you, Jeffrey. Oh, oh, uh. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. You must find a path. And that's what I told him. You must find a path. And did you start dating right away, Marissa? It was not dating the classical sense. We held hands. We felt each other's aura. We did our tarot cards. Sounds classical so far. And then we fornicated. Still classical. And then we would read each other's tea leaves. And that's when it cemented. That's when, when we read each other's tea leaves, we realized this is something. And so that's when we decided we became we. What? What? We. What do you mean we became we? We. As in. Are you French? You and me become we. And we became we. I'm confused, Jeremy, if you want to ask a clarifying question. I, I don't understand how you, two people become one. I, I hope one day you, you 
become a Wii. Like a Nintendo Wii? Well, it sounds like, Marissa, what you're saying is that you and uh, Cisco were so in tune with one another's auras that you became the same person spiritually, right? Not Spiritually, yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, spiritual. I thought what we were saying was like both your bodies got put into one body and you became the same person. Yes, that's what I said. We. But Jeremy just said spiritually. So that's like you're still two different bodies, right? Yes, but a body is a body. A spirit is something more, something greater. We. So, Marissa, I want to ask a little bit about the Thong song, since that's the contribution, I guess, that he has made to American culture. Mm-hmm. Did he write that before he met you or after? Were you an influence in any way? He wrote it actually after while we were dating. Sometimes we would go to the mall together. We, and on the way to Tivana, we came upon the lingerie store, Victoria's Secret. And there they had this display with a synthetic string for underwear. Hmm. Cause at the time thongs were not that popular. Hmm. I was just confused and Cisco was also confused. It was so uncomfortable looking. And I personally wear full body hemp underwear. So it was not what I would ever put on my body. Okay. And so we had a conversation at dinner about what we had just witnessed. And Mm -hmm. I expressed my thoughts to him and, and he, we absolutely understood. He said, wow, yeah, it's very ridiculous. It's, it's, why would anyone put that on their body? And then the next morning he had written a song called The Thong Song. Oh, wow. So I was rather confused. But it seems like he still had a little bit of me left in him. Maybe it was, he was we with someone else. I could feel him kind of drifting. And how was the thong song connected to Relentless? So at the time I looked back and I was so naive. I I didn't realize it was. I was upset with him and I, I said, don't write this. And he, he swore it was just, just a funny song. And so I, I bought it, but I was cleaning out my place, my attic, a few weeks ago. And I found a old box of his things, um, something that I, I had been meaning to give back to him, and he had been meaning to take. And it's just with time, we just forgot about it. But it, it did have a lot of stuff he treasured, and in that old box, there was a copy of Relentless. Wow. <laughs> and on there. Oh, calm down. It's okay. It's okay. I'm sorry. This is. It's just so shocking. I'm, just, I'm trembling. This is a safe place. I like my apartment. On there was a sticky note. Sticky t- to the movie. And there was a sketch of a thong. And then an up arrow. And then the letter S. But not, it was a sketch of the S. You know, the Superman type S. Oh, okay. So three symbols. Yeah. Thong up S. Stickied to that movie. Thong up S. Thong. And I just realized the thong is connected to Relentless. He wanted to increase thong sales. And that would lead to s- Suicide. Oh, wow. Thongs up. Su- oh, thong up S. S is for suicide. Who would be committing suicide? Anyone who wore a thong. Which, yeah, that was a lot of people. Unfortunately, with his song, increased. Yeah. He did listen to me when I said thongs are so uncomfortable. It's, it's so, would it be anyone who wear thongs? This, this synthetic string. Up their dairy air. That's a classical term. All day, just walking around. 
I'm baffled why women still wear thongs and don't commit suicide. Well, I had to uh, stop listening to that song because I started wearing thongs. And then I had a bit of a down spell. I was feeling kind of down and depressed. I was like, I'm uncomfortable all day long. I just feel like I can't get comfortable sitting down. I'm not comfortable standing up, sitting down, running, nothing. And I realized, what what has changed in my life? I'm listening to this song. It's making me feel good about new sexy underwear. But is it worth the trouble? And it wasn't. And I remember as soon as I took the thong off, because I wore the same thong for like six months. As soon as I took the thong off, my life immediately was getting better. I'm so glad you were you saved yourself. Yeah, uh, it was also bad because they were a, a standard issue at a Hollywood Video. Oh, they sell thongs at Hollywood Video. Yeah. So I didn't tell you this before, but during the time when we were promoting Relentless at Hollywood Video, they also were promoting. So that's why Cisco was there because he was also promoting the Thon song because we were playing it at Hollywood Video. It's like people would come in and hear, "Oh, make your booty go." Oh, make a booty go. We. Oui. And then it was like thong, 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 and that was playing. And he we came in to check that and the relentless sales. And now I know why. I didn't know why. I didn't know the connection. But they would do thong checks on the employees. Oh, like if you weren't wearing your thong, they sent you home. Wow. Yeah, they sent you home to go get it. Was it one person's job to do the thong checks? Yeah, it was my job. <laughs> do, do you have any idea how humiliating it is to give yourself a thong check? Nope. Yeah. So. That's, that's tough. Well, Marissa, so was there any data on whether suicides increased after the thong song exploded in sales? Thongs did increase. They're everywhere now, but no suicides. So it didn't work. And yes, it didn't. And women, we walk around with uncomfortable. Bras aren't very comfortable. You're telling me. Headbands, not comfortable. Childbirth, not comfortable. You're telling me. It is hard to get that song out of your mind and and stop wearing thongs. You get but addicted. Even when you aren't mandated to wear one, did you still wear one, Jeffrey? Uh, yeah, so here's the issue. Because we had to watch Relentless so many times and play the thong song a lot, anytime I'm either watching Relentless, I think, where's my thong? And like I like would actively at home go towards my underwear drawer and be like, well, no, no, I don't have to, don't have to do this anymore. Or anytime I'm out and I hear the thong song, I then think, oh, I should kill someone. Oh, the line dumps like a truck, truck, truck. Does that one in particular get in your head? Yeah, because that's how you get rid of a body. At the time, no one understood. His manager asked him, well, "This line makes no sense, Cisco. Yeah, write something else. Write a sexy line." Yeah, but now it now it makes sense. Yes, it goes with relentless. And then you're like, "Oh, you dump the body. You, you know, a truck to transport the body. Put put all your tools in the back." So, Marissa, we're we're almost out of time, unfortunately. But I wanted to give you a chance to tell our our viewers what happened to your relationship with Cisco after you discovered the sticky note. Oh yeah, what happened? I tried to call him with the number I had, I, and his number is disconnected. Like he got a new f number, or? He just cut it off. Oh, wow. Cut me off. It's just hard when you were a we with someone. We. So, Cisco, Marky Mark, if you're listening. Oh, that's two different people. I forgive. And I love you. Well, that is a, a really nice way to end a pretty scary episode of the show. We're going to have to leave it there. Ooh. I want to thank our guest this week, Marissa Horn. Thank you so much for being uh, on Optophobia. Th thanks for being on the, the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Jeffrey Dahmer, for, uh, as always, being my co-host. Please join us next week when our guest will be Billiam Hustig, a film critic from Queens, New York, who has been a vocal critic of this season's premise on social media, claiming that William Lustig was and still is a brilliant director who never used subliminal messages in his films. Billiam Hustig seems to have created his Twitter handle at Fancy Cannibals during the second week of our season and has tweeted that, quote, 
the Octopusia podcast is dumb because if the genius William Lustig had wanted to influence serial killers, thousands would be dead because of the insane amazingness of Relentless. So we will get a chance to ask Billiam about that next week. Make sure to join us. Thank you for listening to Optophobia. I'm Jeremy Jam, and I will leave you with this. Act as an ass acts. Speak as an ass speaks. You're an ass. If you've got a connection to Relentless, we'd like to hear it. You can find us on our website, optophobia.org, or on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at at optophobes. And please subscribe and rate the show if you like it. Thank you to Andrea Quach, who played Marissa Horn. Andrea is a member of the Quitters and Washington Improv Theater Ensemble Team, The Lineup. Follow her on Instagram at Andy underscore Q. Thank you to Jamal Newman, who played Jeffrey Dahmer. Jamal performs with Lena Dunham, a Washington Improv Theater House Ensemble, and Nixon. You can follow him on Instagram and Twitter at at Hello Newman and find him at jamalnewman.com. Optophobia was produced by Tim Townsend. Music was composed by Bart Warshaw. Cover art by Claire Smalley. Additional website art by Nicole Bennett. Website by Chance Griffin. Thanks for listening. Until next week, keep them open. We. Oui.